Hello, yes, I'm Mark Forsyth, and I've written a short history of drunkenness. It's only a short history of drunkenness because if you're trying to do a full history, a complete history about, of how mankind has got drunk, then it would be run into at least 20 volumes. It would be a history of humankind. I was interested in drunkenness because I'm interested in making the familiar strange, looking at things which we use every day, do every day, but we don't stop and think about, which that's why I wrote several books on etymology and the origin of words, where words come from, because it's amazing just to stop for a moment and say, you know, why is a fan of music called a fan? Why, why would that be? Is it something to do with the, the things which are keeping us cool even now? In fact, it's just um, a shortening of, fana of fanatic. So if you're a, a Beatles fan, you're a Beatles fanatic. If you're a Manchester United fan, you're a Manchester United fanatic. And it's that sort of sudden little realization, stopping and looking at the thing straight in front of you that fascinates me. Um, so I set about researching drunkenness. And a lot of people ask me, they, they say, that must have been fun. And they sort of imply or think that I spent the entire time in the pub getting drunk. Um, which is not entirely correct. I wish it were, but I'm afraid I was writing a history. And so I spent my time in the British Library looking through dusty old tomes about the ancient Egyptian festival of drunkenness or, um, exactly, or exactly how things worked in a Viking mead hall and that sort of thing, or researching ancient Chinese attitudes to alcohol and to drunkenness. Um, so I'm, uh, but I do obviously, like a drink. It's a subject very close to my heart, and I'm being careful today because the first time I ever gave a talk on the history of drunkenness, um, the guy I was being interviewed on stage, and the guy interviewing me said, wouldn't it be funny if you um, uh, had a bottle of whiskey with you and you drank from it whilst I interviewed you? And I said, that'd be hilarious. And I've got quite a strong head for alcohol, so I thought this would be good. And I sat down, and I started interviewing me. And the problem is I get rather nervous when I'm up in front of a crowd. Talking. I'm, I'm a shy man at heart, and so I uh, sort of nervous ticks. I sometimes, I, you'll see, I move my arms around a lot. And what I was doing on stage with him was whenever I felt nervous, I just took a swig of whiskey and I finished the bottle during the speech. I remember the beginning of that speech, but not the end. <laughs> Apparently, I'm very nice when I'm very, very blackout drunk. I just, I just start smiling and telling everybody how much I like them. Because, and that's uh, something which is odd, because drunkenness is very much culturally conditioned. It's a strange thing, but nobody, no scientist, really knows what it is that alcohol does to you. What we do know is that alcohol does to you what you think it will do to you. If you believe that people get drunk and then get into fights, then when you get drunk, you will get into a fight. If you come from a culture, though, that believes that when you get drunk, you sing songs and make love, then you will end up singing songs and making love. It is entirely what you believe will happen. There are many religions in the world, even today, where there is um, religious drunkenness, where people uh, get, uh, it's very common in the South Pacific, also in quite a few indigenous religions in South America, where you drink until you hallucinate. And alcohol can make you hallucinate if you believe that it will make you hallucinate. You drink until you have a vision of the gods, for the ancestral spirits, and that will happen to you if you are from that culture. It can't, unfortunately, happen to me. If I drank so much that I saw my dead grandmother coming towards me, I would know that I'd probably drunk too much. So uh, it's actually quite possible to study this in a scientific way as well. There's a standard um, uh, way of doing it, because it's very easy to get student volunteers. You get 100 student volunteers, and you say, would you like free beer for a night, and we will um, study you and check how you behave, and the students tend to say yes, uh, except they don't realize that 50 out of 100 of them are in fact getting alcohol-free beer. And so they think they're getting drunk, but in fact they aren't. And you can watch them doing the things which they believe they should be doing because they're drunk. And they do get violent, or they do um, become amorous, or they start singing songs, because it is so much of it is about that cultural drive and it even goes so far that um, it depends on the, uh, the cultural associations with what you're drinking. If you give an Englishman, for example, beer, he's liable to eat, so we associate that with pubs and possibly getting into a pub fight, that sort of thing. An Englishman will often get aggressive after a bunch of beers. But if you give an Englishman wine, 
they tend not to because we associate that with France and the South and sophistication. And so on wine, an Englishman is utterly safe. Well, not utterly, but uh, as there's a good chance that they are. Drinking is absolutely culturally divided. But, of course, you can go for people with our culture, uh, without culture, or more indeed, more precisely, for creatures without culture, because many, many animals drink. And alcohol occurs naturally. It occurs whenever fruit starts to go off, the sugars decay, they become alcohol. Um, alcohol. Even, even the little fruit flies drink. And in fact, there's a, a strange study which showed that when a male fruit fly approaches a female fruit fly, but is rejected sexually, romantically, that male fruit fly then goes and dramatically increases his alcohol consumption. And nobody knows why that is. Nobody even knows whether fruit flies are conscious. But it looks like, it kind of looks like fruit flies are drinking to forget. Drinking to cure a broken heart. And uh, <laughs> we are, though, we are one of the, um, we're the second best drinking species in the entire world. 10% of your liver is actually devoted, um, the enzymes in your uh, liver is devoted to turning alcohol, ethanol, into energy. And we have by body weight, the best head for alcohol in the world, apart from the Malaysian tree shrew, which can actually outdrink us. So never, ever get into a drinking contest with a Malaysian tree shrew. Or if you do, don't let them say, let's adjust this for body weight. But alcohol does occur naturally, as I say. The, um, uh, um, uh, monkeys and chimpanzees absolutely love alcohol. In fact, there's an island off Costa Rica where there's a fruit which um, decays particularly quickly and particularly quickly becomes alcoholic. And the mantled howler monkeys on this island just um, eat this fruit all day, every day. And they get drunk. They can, they can drink, they, well, taking the equivalent amount of alcohol, if you adjust for body weight, of about three bottles of wine per hour. And then they just lie around in the treetops, absolutely slosh. And occasionally they just fall out of the treetops and die because they are so drunk. And scientists are fascinated by this, and they do an awful lot of experiments on different animals. They do things like um, uh, you can give uh, just an open bar, a completely free bar to a species and see how they react. You do that with chimpanzees, for example, and they just get drunk and they stay drunk. Um, alternatively, if you do that with rats, a colony of rats, we are very social creatures. For the first few days, there's absolute chaos and the rats get drunk. But then they quickly fall into a habit and into a routine. They um, drink twice a day. They drink once just before they feed, which scientists refer to as the aperitif. And then they drink um, just before they go to sleep, which scientists refer to as the nightcap. And then every four or five days, suddenly the whole colony dramatically ups its alcohol consumption, just briefly. So it seems as though they're having little rat parties, which makes them sound very, very fun. You don't want to be too anthropological, though, because there is a sinister side to rat culture and rat drinking culture, which is that um, a rat colony is organized in, into a very hierarchical society with the, the, the lowest status at the bottom, and right at the top there is the king rat, as he is referred to, the alpha male, if you will. Um, now, the king rat in a, um, a rat colony with a free bar never actually drinks. He's always a teetotaler, whereas the real drunkards are the lowest status males. They're the ones who are nervous. They're the ones who don't like their lives. And they're the ones who have to drink to forget, to forget about their horrible social condition. And this is something which actually crops up again in the human history of drunkenness. And scientists spend an awful lot of time giving booze to animals. And it, I was reading all about all these experiments in the, in the library, and I couldn't help sniggering. I couldn't help imagining the scientists going, you know what? What if we gave, like, dogs booze, or maybe, like, elephants or something? And they go, yeah, let's try it, let's try it. And I mean, I mean, there, it could be quite hard. If you want to get an elephant drunk, for example, you have to um, get a Land Rover in a nature reserve, put a huge barrel of beer on the back, drive it near to a big male elephant, and then just sit there whilst he drinks it and see how he reacts. Um, and the truth is, by the way, elephants are very, very bad drinkers. Never get an elephant drunk. Don't do this because they, they, they get aggressive. So then in that particular experiment I was reading about, um, this elephant then just wandered off towards a rhino and picked a fight with it for no reason. Elephants never fight rhinos, but this elephant was drunk. 
And indeed, there was a case in India in the late 1980s in northeastern India where um, a herd of 150 elephants found an illegal distillery. And so they broke into it and they drank it dry. And the entire herd got drunk, and it's 150 elephants. And if you think about one drunk elephant, that's, that's too many. 150 drunk elephants is uncontrollable, undealable with. And they went on a rampage. And I, I, I can see people in the audience grinning. And I, I find it funny, and I shouldn't find it funny, because seven people were killed. They demolished whole villages. They knocked down concrete buildings because, well, they were 150 drunk elephants. And you do not want to get into a fight with a drunken elephant. So before we were humans, before we were humans, we were drinkers. But then, of course, the great advantage of being a human, more than anything else, more than the ability to stand on two legs or to um, read or make music or think or develop self-consciousness, is that we can manufacture alcohol. We can make it whenever we want. We don't have to be born lucky in an island of Costa Rica. Um, so it's a question, of course, of when did we start doing this in any kind of organized way? And why were it? So when we came down from the trees, for example. There is, by the way, a theory. We came down from the trees about 10 million years ago. And um, uh, it's also about 10 million years ago that we developed the one particular genetic mutation in our livers, which makes us the second best drinking species in the entire world. And so there's a theory that puts that together. It's called the drunken monkey hypothesis. That is quite seriously its scientific name. Um, that we came down from the trees in order to get the overripe fruit, in order to get the alcohol. And so that would make drunkenness a big moment in evolution. You can't be sure of that. And there are many other evolutionary drunken theories. There's a, a very nice one, which is that um, the reason we like to drink socially is that it will be an evolutionary advantage. If you are um, a drunk man on his own in the jungle or whatever, uh, uh, a big predator might come and, atta and attack you. But if you are a group of drunk men, then the big predator will probably leave you alone. And this will be a vestigial thing of why we like to get together and to drink socially. But um, the, first, um, uh, uh, the, the first evidence of human drinking, pictorial evidence, comes from a stone carving in France known as the Venus of Locelle which um, depicts a woman holding what appears to be a drinking horn up to her lips. We can't tell that it was definitely alcohol in there, but usually people don't um, depict something as boring as drinking water, so she may well be the very first recorded drinker. Um, and we know that 9,000 years ago, we were definitely manufacturing wine. That's the earliest archaeological evidence we can find, because wine leaves a trace in pottery of tartaric acid. And so it, that was in China, but we were probably manufacturing it earlier than that. Booze may well be the reason that we stopped being hunter-gatherers and settled down to form civilization. Um, alcohol, uh, sorry, uh, uh, farming developed in uh, around 9000 BC, and nobody quite knows why we stopped, why we stopped chasing animals, killing them, eating them, and we therefore moving around, following the herds. But at some point, we stopped built houses, started agriculture, planting fields. And a lot of people say, well, obviously, it's you know, to make bread and yeah, you know, that's kind of nice, easy thing. But unfortunately, man cannot survive on bread alone. Quite literally, bread doesn't contain vitamin B. You can get vitamin B by hunting animals, wandering around, chasing them, or you can get vitamin B from beer. Beer is better than bread in an awful lot of very practical ways. For example, if you've just got a pile of barley and you want to get the most possible calories out of it, it is better to turn it into beer and brew it and drink it like that than it is to turn it into bread because the fermentation process is actually something of the equivalent of outsourcing digestion. So rather than having to use your energy to break it down, you get it already broken down and in its beautiful, sugary, nutritious form. Also, of course, bread requires a very, very hot oven, and that, which came first. You can't settle down and say, let's make bread, if you've never had the oven to make the bread. So that's uh, difficult. Also, um, uh, beer can be stored. It's a wonderful way of um, making your, your food and then leaving it for weeks on end before you drink it, whereas bread, as we all know, goes stale after a day or so. 
Furthermore, alcohol makes water safe. Water is, um, generally speaking, in its natural state filled with diseases, um, whereas the process of fermentation purifies it. In fact, what, uh, what happens in fermentation is that um, the bacteria devour the sugars, they turn it into alcohol, until the alcohol content becomes so strong that it kills all the bacteria. And that's when fermentation stops. And that's why beers and wines, if traditionally made, have those standard alcohol contents. That's the point at which there can be no more bacteria to um, perform the fermentation process. And um, this is also important because, finally, the thing about settling down, I need to be blunt here, is if you're going to live in one place, it means you're going to be drinking the water from near where you're defecating. And that is a very bad thing, generally speaking, because some parts of your feces will get into the water table, into the water sources, and then you'll be drinking that back, and you will die if you haven't already died from the lack of vitamin B in your diet. The result of these seven arguments is to say that it's probably we settled down to drink, to make booze. That's why we came down from the trees. That's also why we started civilizations. And also, finally, on this point, in order to persuade people to utterly change their way of life, to say to a tribe of hunters, saying, we've got to stop hunting, we've got to settle down, you need a cultural drive. You need something more than a little practical reason of, oh, if we settled down and built an oven and found water sources. And, uh, because people just don't change like that, but they will change for booze. Booze can give you that cultural drive, be the lead of the cultural drive to say, here we settle, here we brew our beer. So that's the prehistory of booze. Now we are going to, um, but I wanted to obviously to work into the question of history, how, uh, how things played out, what was a bar like, what was a drinking session like at the beginning of civilization. And you can find out quite a bit about this. If you go, for example, to the third millennium um, in uh, ancient Mesopotamia, what's now Iraq, Iran sort of area, there was writing. People wrote poems. We know an awful lot about their mythology. And we know about, for example, the uh, Mesopotamian goddess of beer, the goddess Ninkazi, who was always making beer and um, indeed drinking beer and getting into drinking contests. And um, ancient Uruk would have actually been quite familiar to us. It had, in its um, town, it had uh, little bars. They were usually down side streets. You would go in through a low door. It would be quite dark in there. Um, it, uh, we, know, we know that. We, we know that the door would probably have been surrounded by prostitutes who were plying for trade, wearing their singlet garments and a string of pearls, which apparently showed you were a prostitute in those days. Um, once inside, it's very dark. You can smell the beer. There are accounts of how much it smelled because um, the brewing, brewing is going on inside that bar. Every bar is a little microbrewery. And you can also um, pick between different kinds of beer. You could ask for a beer that fizzes like the Pacme Canal. I don't know why a canal would fizz. Or you could have dark beer, light beer. There are all sorts of varieties. You could be quite a snob. You could um, show your taste off to the, the woman behind the bar. And indeed, it was a bar woman. It, um, the bars were always owned by women for some reason. Um, they're referred to in the Code of Hammurabi. It just assumes, it says, if the owner of a bar serves false measures, short measures of beer, then she must be executed. It's just assumed that it's a she, because bar owners always were. And then you would, um, uh, so you buy a big jar of beer, which would be about that sort of size, um, and you would get several straws. And then you would sit with your friends around the jar of beer. You'll get the long, they were straws made out of reeds. And you would stick the, your straws into the beer. And um, you could all sit around there sipping away at the same big jar. This actually worked very nicely because um, there was an awful lot of sediment in the beer back then. But that sediment would rise to the top and your straw would go through to the good beer below. There are still, by the way, some places in Africa where they drink beer by the same method. You can see photographs now of them doing it. And you can also see illustrations from 3,000, oh, sorry, from four and a half thousand years ago of people drinking in that way. And then there's the question of what you did with your friends whilst you were sitting there sharing your beer, sipping beer through a straw. And the answer is, uh, it's rather nice and familiar. You would um, tell jokes, for example. There are whole books of um, uh, jokes from ancient Mesopotamia. 
they aren't necessarily that funny by our standards. Um, things like um, a famous joke is, a thing that has never happened since the beginning of time, a woman who sat on her husband's lap without farting. Not the greatest joke, but one of the earliest recorded. There's also another one in that same joke book which says, a dog walks into a tavern and says, I can't see anything, I'll open one. And nobody can understand what that joke is anymore. There must be a pun or something which has been lost in the mists of time. But that is the earliest animal walks into a bar joke ever recorded. And so you'd tell jokes to your friends. You'd have drinking contests. That was um, a quite a popular thing. Um, there are stories of Ninkazi having drinking contests. There's obviously um, the question of the prostitutes just outside the door, who were almost certainly there for a reason, as it were. And um, finally, you would sing songs. And there were drinking songs back then. Um, and they are recorded and written down. I translated one. I shall read it out to you in my translation. I um, added some rhymes to this, but uh, this is pretty accurate. Uh, it's about, by the way, the, uh, the brewing process. And in it, it mentions several of the, um, the vessels and containers that were used for making beer. We don't quite know what they are, but things like the gackle vat. Um, well, I shall read on. The gackle vat, the gackle vat, the gackle vat, the lamzari vat, the gackle vat, which makes sure that we're happy. The lamzari vat, vat, we're pleased with that, but the urkabu jar is the best by far. The sagab jar is full, filled with beer. The amam jar brings it over here. The troughs and the pails and the pots and the pans are all laid out on their neat pot stands. May the heart of your God be on your side, for gackle vat is our heart and our guide. It's good for you, and it's good for me, and it makes us sing so merrily. If you spilled your beer on the tavern floor, you'll be happy with Ninkazi. That's the goddess of beer. Happy with Ninkazi forevermore. We'll live in peace, and we'll do just fine, for we love the sound of her beer and wine. All of the troughs are filled with beer, and the boys and the brewers and the bearers are here. I'm spinning around on a beery lake. I'm feeling great. I'm feeling great. I'm drinking beer in a blissful mood. I'm feeling... I'm I feel so fine drinking what's been brewed. I'm happy in my body, both up and down, and my heart is robed in a regal gown. The heart of Inanna is happy again. That's another goddess. The heart of Inanna is happy again, O Ninkazi. Um, so that's probably how you ended up your evening in ancient U Uruk. But um, things could get an awful lot stranger and less familiar than that. So for example, in ancient Egypt, they were very, very, very fond of drinking. And I mean really fond of drinking. In fact, I have one of the heaviest drinking cultures I've ever come across, especially, by the way, the women. The women of ancient Egypt loved to get absolutely plastered. And they were proud of it. There are illustrations of them doing it. There's a lovely illustration of a, um, a, 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 regal, a, sort of a regal woman, maybe a queen. We can't tell who she is. And she's vomiting over the slave who's holding the wine cup for her. There are quite a few such illustrations, but it's, it's, it's very strange. She was proud enough of this that she wanted it painted on the walls. And vomiting was a big thing. Drink till you throw up. And there was an, another woman who put um, up uh, in Egypt, you sort of put up a you know, monument to yourself. The, uh, the, one of the main activities, it seems, was building your own grave and making sure absolutely everything about your tomb was going to be perfect. So there's one woman, and uh, for this you'll need to know that traveling the marshes was an uh, ancient Egyptian phrase for having sex. And so she put, as her own epitaph, written by her, she said, I was a mistress of drunkenness, one who loved a good day, who looked forward to roaming the marshes every day, anointed with myrrh and perfumed with lotus scent. That's what an ancient Egyptian woman wanted to be remembered as. And she is still remembered like that, three and a half thousand years later. But let us get to the ancient Egyptian festival of drunkenness. How am I doing for time? So, right? so there was the goddess Hathor, who was the goddess of beer. And indeed, she had once tried to kill all of mankind until she was put off her stride by being got incredibly drunk on, I think it was 600 barrels of beer. And she got so drunk that she decided she would not kill mankind and instead lie down and have a little snooze. And to celebrate this event, every year the ancient Egyptians held the festival of drunkenness in, in the temple of Hathor. Now this was an elite 
uh, festival, it would be the rich noblemen, kings, royals were there, and of course priests. And uh, what happens, the temple was beside the Nile, a boat would arrive at sunset, everybody would be wearing all their best clothes, their finest clothes had been anointed with perfume, it must have smelled lovely. And at sunset, the statue, of, a small statue of the goddess Hathor would be taken from the boat and carried with much dancing and singing and procession and waving of musical instruments. If you're ever at an ancient Egyptian drinking session, you have to stand like this for some reason when you're dancing, I don't know why. Um, into the temple, and once he was in the temple in the Great Hall, everyone in, went in there and got incredibly drunk. You drank and drank and drank till you vomited, and then you drank and drank and drank till you vomited, and then you drank and drank and drank till you vomited. The vomiting was absolutely essential. If you weren't throwing up, you had to drink beer with special emetics put in it just so that you would throw up, which must have been incredibly unpleasant. And you wonder why they cover themselves in perfume before doing this. But what you did then was you had sex. They had a great big orgy. All the elites, men, women, there in the temple, they had sex in amongst all the vomit, presumably, which is a horrible idea to me. But they were happy with this. They were proud of this. There was another guy who wrote his own epitaph in which he boasted of how he was conceived in the Temple of Hathor at the Festival of Drunkenness. And he, you know, this was what he wanted to be remembered as. And indeed, his mother had made him the biggest beneficiary in her will. So apparently, he was her favorite child. She must have had fond memories of that night. But when the orgy had finished, in the small hours of the morning, everybody would fall asleep on the uh, floor of the temple. And whilst they were asleep, the priests, very sneakily, would go out into the side chapel where there was a colossal statue of Hathor. And they would somehow probably wheel it into the main hall amongst all the revelers who were now just lying around, snoring, blackout drunk. And they would put it, set it up right in the middle. And then they would wait for the first light of dawn. And when that first light of dawn came up, it would come through the window onto the face of the goddess Hathor. And at that point, all the priests would bring out their tambourines and their flutes and their instruments and dance around making a huge noise until everybody woke up. And I don't know if you've ever woken up while still horribly drunk, but it's a very disorientating experience. And the first thing you would see would be a gigantic goddess Hathor immediately above you, her face illumined in the uh, dawn light. And at that moment, you were meant to have an experience of the deity. You were at one with Hathor. And whatever you asked her, at that moment, she would grant you. But you probably couldn't remember what you wanted to ask her anyway. This is in complete contrast to, say, the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks had a symposium um, with, to which women were not allowed at all. Indeed, the symposium was in the andron, or in the man's room, that women just didn't have access to. And it was a much more organized affair. It was a different thing, really. Uh, the ancient Greeks, by the way, thought that drunkenness was a wonderful test of a man. It was, uh, it was like practice, that if, if a man had, was good enough that he was a good man when he was drunk, that meant he was definitely a good man sober. And so it was a, like a test of your self-control. Socrates was considered a wonderful man because he was exactly the same drunk and sober, which shows that he was at peace within, as it were. Um, and so, oh, am I doing that? There is always this question of how drunkenness, this anarchy, fits into society. How does it fit into politics? How do you make a structured society with this anarchic ferret right in the middle? Um, and it's fit in all sorts of strange ways. For example, the ancient Persians, when they had an important political decision to make, would debate the question twice. First, they would debate it drunk, and then they would debate it sober. And if they came to the same conclusion both times, then they would act and go to war or whatever it was. A very sensible system in um, uh, my view. Um, similarly, you had, um, but in, uh, in contrast, in uh, China, for example, drinking at, amongst the political class has always been seen as the absolute worst thing ever. There are stories of semi-mythical, ancient, evil emperors who um, would build um, lakes of wine. There are meant to be two lakes of wine in which they could um, paddle around in a little canoe and then just sort of lean over the side to drink some wine. And the second one of them actually had an island in the middle of the lake with a tree which was hung with sweetmeats 
So you could um, sort of um, paddle around in your wine and then go and pick a, you know, a, a, a lovely piece of bacon or something like that. It sounds wonderful to me. But both of these emperors were definitely evil, according to the Chinese, and they were both punished and they both died. There is very little um, elite Chinese drinking. Incidentally, it's very, a very similar situation in most of the history of India. It's always been a bad thing for a king to um, get drunk or even to drink at all. Although, actually, oddly enough, all right for um, inferior classes. And so um, you also have the, uh, the ancient um, uh, German barbarians who are described on by, just a second, uh, the Roman historian Tacitus. He says, to pass an entire day and night in drinking disgraces no one. Their quarrels, as might be expected with intoxicated people, are seldom fought out with mere abuse, but commonly with words and bloodshed. Yet it is at, these, at their feasts that they generally consult on the reconciliation of enemies, on the forming of matrimonial alliances, on the choice of chiefs, finally even on peace and war. For they think that at no time is a mind more open to simplicity of purpose or more warmed to noble aspirations. A race without either natural or acquired cunning, they disclose their hidden thoughts in the freedom of the festivity. Thus, the sentiments of all having been discovered and laid bare, the discussion is renewed on the following day, and from each occasion, its own peculiar advantage is derived. They deliberate when they have no power to dissemble. They resolve when error is impossible. Um, but in most societies, drunkenness, as I say, has to fit in. It has to find its place somewhere within that society, with the rules around it, with the sober life as the main structure and alcohol in the middle. That is not the case with the Vikings. The Vikings, the um, seaborne raiders of um, the late first millennia, um, didn't they didn't have a little god of drunkenness, like a lot of cultures do. They're the gods of drunkenness, like Ninkazi, Dionysus, or Bacchus, or Hathor, who are all junior gods. For them, the chief god was the god of drunkenness. And I'm going to read you my chapter on Vikings. And that ought to take us through. For on wine alone, weapon good Odin always lives. Odin chief god of Vikings, drank nothing but wine. In fact, he consumed nothing but wine. He didn't eat at all. Nothing to soak up the vino, not even a cheese canapé. The poetic Edda is quite firm on the point. It may seem odd that a Scandinavian deity should devote himself to wine, wine not being a well-known Scandinavian product. But that's the point. Wine was the most expensive drink that a rich Viking could buy. It would come up from Germany, or even France, imported from the remnants of the Roman Empire. Wine was a status symbol, and so Odin, top god of the Viking pantheon, pretty much had to have it. The king of gods could hardly drink ale. It would look bad. It may also seem odd that Odin didn't eat anything. Wine on an empty stomach is bad for you. Such a regime, continued for all eternity, can cause stomach problems and will almost certainly result in drunkenness. That Odin only drank wine is probably the reason his name literally means the frenzied one. Some people translate it as the ecstatic one, but to be honest, given his diet, it probably just meant the drunk one. This is a reversal. Most polytheistic religions have one chief god and then a god of drunkenness, or wine, or brewing, etc., somewhere on the side. Enlil, Ninkazi, Zeus, Dionysius. The drunken god turns up, causes some fun and chaos, but is always subject to the wiser ways and greater powers of the chief god, who usually has a beard. You don't need to be the sharpest theologian to interpret this as drunkenness having to be find its niche within society, its little spot where it can be tamed and controlled. But with the Vikings, the chief god is the drunk god. The chief god is actually called the drunk one. There is no other Viking, uh, other Viking god of alcohol. It's Odin. That's because alcohol and drunkenness didn't need to find their place within Viking society. They were Viking society. Alcohol was authority, alcohol was family, alcohol was wisdom, alcohol was poetry, alcohol was military service, and alcohol was fate. It must have been rather hard to be a teetotal Viking, and no record of such a creature exists. Now, a little something ought to be said here about the varieties of Viking booze. There were only three. There was wine, as mentioned above, 
and as mentioned above, uh, wine was immensely expensive and almost nobody could get hold of it. The next drink down the pecking order was mead, fermented honey, sweet and reasonably expensive. Almost everybody all the time just drank ale. Their ale is probably slightly stronger than ours, at about 8% ABV, and would, according to reconstructions, have been dark and malty. But in the Viking sagas, all the heroes drink mead because mead was posher. Similarly, if you wanted to set yourself up as a lord, you needed to build a mead hall. Even if all you ever served in it was ale, you still called it a mead hall for appearances sake. Your mead hall could be, uh, um, even be quite small, somewhere about 10 feet by 15. Others were huge, 100 yards in length. In Beowulf, when Hrothgar wants to become a mighty king, he builds Herot, the biggest mead hall that anyone has ever seen, filled with pillars and gold. The mead hall makes you a lord because the very first duty of a lord is to provide booze to his warriors. This was the formal way in which you showed your lordship. And conversely, if you went to somebody's mead hall and drank their mead, you were honor bound to protect them militarily. Alcohol was literally power. It was how you swore people to loyalty. A king without a mead hall would be like a banker with no money or a library with no books. You also needed a queen because, strange as it may seem, women were rather important, if a trifle subjugated, part of the mead hall feast. Women, or peace weavers, as the Vikings called them, were the ones who kept the formal footing of the feast going, who lubricated the rowdy atmosphere and provided a healthy dose of womanly calm. They were in charge of the logistics of the sumble, which was the Norse name for a drunken feast. They may even have enjoyed the beginning of the evening. The first three drinks, which were to Odin, for victory, to Njord and Freya, for peace and good harvest, and then the minis or the memory ale, to spirits of ancestors and of dead friends. The first drink of the evening would be served very formally by the queen to her husband. She would pour him his mead through a little sieve that she kept on a chain around her neck. This was also the point at which she could formally and publicly advise him. This was probably just simple advice, like drink up, but it was also a chance to make any formal announcement. Once the king had drunk, she would then serve all his warriors in descending order of rank, and finally, she would serve the guests. In fact, serving the drinks was the defining role of a woman in the Viking Age. In poetry, you didn't call a woman a woman, you just called her a drink server. There's a 13th century manual on poetry for the aspiring bard. It lays down that a woman should be referred to in terms, by the way, this isn't me, this is the Vikings, just so you know. A woman should be referred to in terms of all the types of female attire, gold and precious stones and ale, wine and other beverages that she pours or serves. Likewise, in terms of receptacles for ale and all the things that it is fitting for her to do or to provide. So a woman, a woman could be called an ale giver or a mead maiden or a drinks dispenser because to the Viking mind, which wasn't very gentlemanly, that's all she was. The reason for this paraphrasis was that the Vikings could never call a spade a spade. All Viking poetry was built around the principle of finding an obscure term for a familiar object. So the sea was called whale's drink, or the realm of lobsters, or frothing ale of the shore. Blood was warm ale of wolves. Fire was destruction of houses. And heaven was the burden of dwarves. So what makes Viking poetry so pleasantly incomprehensible? Um, how are we doing for time? I'm, I'm running out of time, so I shall, um, I shall uh, move on. I, what I did in this book, what I wanted to do, was to um, see how a particular feast at a particular time would work, how, uh, what it was like to actually go to a Wild West saloon, for example, or to an old English tavern. You know, we all seen it in a Robin Hood film. There's, he goes into the little village um, in and drinks ale. In fact, there were no pubs in England at the time of Robin Hood or the time of Richard I, which is when it's set. The pub didn't get invented until the 14th century, so that's completely wrong. And there are other great quirks of history. I've got a chapter about the founding of Australia as a penal colony, but Australia was founded to be a dry colony forever. There was never going to be any alcohol in Australia, according to the British government which has to be in the list of plans that didn't come off. <laughs> One of the greatest in all human history. It's, it's up, up there with the right that will last for a thousand years and Napoleon's invasion of Russia. Um, what I was looking for was the similarities and the differences across history. For example, in Prohibition. In Prohibition, 
was in America this from 1919 onwards when um, they tried to ban all alcohol and it didn't work out very well. But uh, what a lot of people don't know about prohibition is that was actually a feminist movement uh, in origin. The idea was that men would get paid at the end of the week and they would take all their money straight down to the saloon and spend it all on drink and then come home with nothing for their wives and children in a bad mood, drunk, and probably beating their wives up. It was, their alcohol was seen as a cause of domestic violence and therefore prohibition. That, that, or, I mean, it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's the line. And oddly enough, I've been in uh, Kerala for four days now, two of which have been dry days. <laughs> I'm not very happy about that. Uh, the first one had a, a, a clear historical explanation, the anniversary of uh, Gandhi's death, but uh, the, the second one is it's, it's the first of the month, and I was asking around, saying, well, why? Why would the first of the month be a dry day? And I was told, apparently, that it's because that's often the payday, and so that's when men would get their salaries, and they might just take it straight down to the wine shop or the toddy shop and spend it all on booze. And I think, well, that's exactly the same. You have these strange absolute parallels and connections across continents and across history, but you also have these strange differences. The, uh, you know, like the ancient Egyptians, where you're looking at them saying, I cannot believe you did that. You drank the same thing as me, but you did something completely different. And I wanted to have, end up, at the end of this study, with a, um, a sort of a, a, a grand unified theory of what drunkenness was. But I'm afraid that I didn't uh, get there. Um, I'm just going to read you my epilogue, which is um, the final part of um, my conclusions on drunkenness. In Animal Farm, the animals rise up in revolt because Mr. Jones, the farmer, is a drunk. At the end of the story, they peer through the windows at the pigs who are now drinking beer, and it is at that moment that they realize that the swine have become human. This is the same story that was told in the Epic of Gilgamesh 4,000 years ago. Enkidu was a wild man who lived and ate and drank water with the animals. Then the priestess of Ishtar gives him beer, and the animals know that he is no longer one of them. In West Africa, there's a story of how the creator god taught women how to make porridge and brew beer. And when they did it, their fur and their tails fell off, and we became human. Wherever and whenever humans have lived, they have gathered together to get intoxicated. The world experienced in sober solitude is not and never has been quite enough. The drugs vary, of course, but they are always there. Occasionally, people talk of a war on drugs, which is silly. Drugs are a constant. There is merely a war between drugs, and it is one that alcohol almost always wins. Mind you, if the government really did want to stamp out heroin or cocaine or whatnot, they could do it quite easily by removing the tax on booze. We are a simple species, and our choice of intoxicant is basically dependent on price and availability. But what is drunkenness? What is this undying human uh, ambition? There are so few constants to this constant. It's more that there are recurring characters. There's a strong man who can drink and drink and never get drunk, Socrates, Confucius, and to some extent, Stalin. Conversely, there's a strong man who is drunk all the time, Peter the Great, Odin, Babur, and for that matter, Alexander the Great, who conquered the known world in something of a haze. There is transitional drinking. We drink to move from one state to another. We drink to mark the end of the working day or the end of the working week. Or, if you're a member of the Suri tribe of Ethiopia, you drink to mark the beginning of the working day. As they put it, where there is no beer, there is no work. We drink at christenings, we drink at marriages, we drink at birthdays, and we drink at funerals. And each time the drink means something. It means that an old state of affairs has gone and that a new, slightly wobblier world is here. The Atizu of Kenya have a pleasant little ritual with new babies. A name is chosen, and then the grandmother dips her finger in beer and puts it to the infant's mouth. If the baby sucks, then that is the name forever. There's drinking as, as escape, the anthropologist's third place of the alehouse, the saloon, or the kabak. But there are cultures where this is strikingly absent, Arabia, Persia, or medieval England. Why don't we all drink at home? Why is the brass rail of the saloon or the pub fruit machine such a potent symbol of emancipation. From what are we escaping? That we don't know the answer is, I think, the answer. Ever since mankind descended from the trees with that useful mu mutation in ethanol active class 4 alcohol dehydrogenases, we have asked ourselves two questions. Is this all there is? And do I have to? 
Any society is an edifice of rules, and no matter how good those rules are, how reasonable, how just, how sensibly worked out for our own safety and welfare, we must occasionally escape them. Humankind has a compulsion to create rules and then to break them. This makes humankind a trifle silly, but also a trifle glorious. The answer to the other question is, um, is, uh, is similarly alcoholic. Is this all there is? Perhaps, probably, but if we were given vastly more, we would still be asking the same question. Humans are not satisfied, and that too is our glory. We're always looking for new oceans to cross, not because we need to, but because we're bored. We like to talk of the ultimate truth, but we would be so disappointed if we found it, because there would be no more. We long for a God we can't describe, because the only description we as humans can give is of a particularly crafty magician. And we know that God is more than that. God can never be boring. Humans are never bored when they're drunk. William James still put it best. Sobriety diminishes, discriminates, and says no. Drunkenness expands, unites, and says yes. Drunkenness is a heap of contradictions, but it says yes to everything. Sometimes it's an instigator of violence, and sometimes of peace. It makes us sing, and it makes us sleep. To the Greeks, it was a test of self-control. To the Norsemen, it was the source of poetry, both good and bad. It's the joy of kings, and it's their downfall. It's the solace of the poor and the cause of their poverty. To governments, it's the cause of ru the riots and a means of revenue. It's a proof of virility, a remover of virility, a means of seduction and a merry matron. Drunkenness is a plague and a killer, a gift of the gods. It's the monk's necessity and the blood of the Messiah. Drunkenness is a way of experiencing God, and drunkenness is a god. That's why it will always be around. Recently, NASA published an internal report admitting that on at least two space shuttle launches, astronauts were properly, full-on, hiccup and happiness drunk. That's completely true, by the way. This does not surprise. People have been working drunk for millennia, and to be honest, if I were about to be fired at several times the speed of sound towards an endless void, I would want a shot of the old reliable. That's our past, and that is, I'm sure, our future. Someday, far from now, when the chimpanzee Chimpanzees have taken over the breweries, when the elephants have occupied the distilleries, and all the pubs are filled with lovelorn fruit flies. We shall, as a species, down our final earthly noggins, stumble into our spacecraft, and leave behind this little ball of rock. It will be a great journey. As we break above the atmosphere, leaving this old earth behind us, the gods will be there to cheer us on. Ninkazi, Hathor, Dionysus, Bacchus, Thor, the tents on Totecton, Madame Geneva, the Venus of Lozelle will blow her horn and get it the right way round for once, and we shall zoom drunkenly into the infinite. And I know where we shall be heading. Sagittarius B2N. It's a cloud 26,000 light years away, and those who start the journey will not be there for its completion. But it's 150 light years across and 3 million times the mass of the sun. An unimaginably vast cloud of naturally occurring space alcohol. And there, finally, in the nether reaches of nothingness, we shall, because we are human, become cosmically drunk. Thank you. That was brilliant, Mark. Oh, thank you. Uh, you said elephants shouldn't get drunk. But there is this legend on Amarula. Amarula cream? Amarula, Amarula in Africa. Uh, yes. Amarula. Is it true? I mean, the elef elephants drinking this fruit and dancing all the way. Is it true? That's my number one first question. Secondly, uh, uh, has prohibition succeeded anywhere in the world? Has sorry. prohibition succeeded anywhere oh, in the world? Oh, number two. Number oh. three, you have any uh, favorite single malt or spirit? You seem to be a good connoisseur of sorts. <laughs> um, I mean, there are so many strange um, listen, prohibitions. I, it's, the changes of the prohibitions were what fascinated me so much. There are, obviously, there are states in India which are uh, dry states, and um, uh, Iceland was a dry country for quite a long time. But there are also so many rules which we just internalize. I mean, in England, for some reason, I don't know why, it's wrong. We all know that it's wrong to drink before noon, except for some reason at, in, um, at cricket matches and in airports. I don't know why, but in an airport, it's fine to it's a 6 a.m. point. Um, so the prohibitions have always fascinated me, fascinated me and um, uh, 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 
Yes, so the, and the, the, the changes in them all. In, in terms of the, uh, the man dancing across Africa, uh, I, I don't know of, of that one, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm not familiar with it. Sorry. Then your favorite. Your favorite. Your favorite. Oh, sorry. Your favorite drink. Your favorite drink. Oh, what's my favorite drink? I like scotch. Yes. Uh, uh, I like a good, uh, Canlila is probably my favorite. Yes. Hi. Oh, Hi. Thanks for the great talk. Thank you. Do you find a lot of similarity between the Egyptian style of drinking and the kind of drinking that you see in universities across the world, especially in the UK? <laughs> um, no, uh, because I mean, the Egyptians took it so much further. I mean, first, first of all, they did just take it farther. I I went to university in the UK, and there was, uh, if there were any orgies, I wasn't invited to them, I'm afraid. <laughs> The one strange things about the uh, Egyptian model there is that this was the elite, the people at the top of society, and grown adults and married, who were ritualizing that and formalizing that. And this, we shall go on and do it in the temple. And you have to go and do it in the temple. As opposed to the sort of hidden, drunken, I mean, to go back to the rat colony that I mentioned earlier, so, you know, the, the downtrodden people maybe just wanting to drink to forget. This was the elite drinking to forget, which is um, very strange. But yes, a university drinking is, I mean, in a sense, is that sort of transitional drinking of um, a stage of life. I need to um, find my own rules, break the old rules, and I need to have a drink to, um, drink to mark my movement from childhood or teenagerhood to adulthood, I think. Uh, hi. Um, uh, just to let you know, I'm not old enough to drink yet. Uh, so my question is, you did say that uh, alcohol, the manufacture of alcohol was integral to human civilization, the development of human civilization. Yes. So may I ask whether you think that uh, drugs, you know, were like marijuana, cannabis, do you think they are also important to human civilization or do you think they should be disposed? Oh, um, so when I said uh, alcohol, I, I think you're referring to a bit that, that alcohol is why we stopped moving around as hunter-gatherers um, and uh, instead decided to settle down in houses um, uh, and plant fields was in order to brew alcohol. There's a very good argument for that. It's not completely certain, but I, w I was going through that, that, that being the reasoning um, as a causal drive in civilization. But that's... Um, in terms of uh, the other drugs, um, uh, that I don't think there would be any need to settle down. Actually, I don't know. It depends which drug you, you want to make. Some of them, obviously, like um, cannabis, grow naturally. Some of them uh, require you know, meth labs or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not <laughs> much of an expert on these things. I haven't been in the cocaine business since that holiday to Colombia. Um, uh, but uh, the thing about drugs, generally speaking, is that they need to be socialized. You need to have those rules, those internal prohibitions of don't drink before noon, unless you're at a cricket match. Um, uh, because when you, you have that, you have a way of uh, uh, taking your drug, whatever it is, alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, or uh, cocaine, or crystal meth, without, um, without uh, messing yourself up. You need to know when to stop, when's, well, what's right and what's wrong. Um, uh, the problem I have, therefore, with illegal drugs is people don't really know how to take them because um, they're illegal. I remember friends of mine who uh, 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 smoked cannabis at university, and they just uh, they got out of the family home. They can now smoke cannabis whenever they wanted, and they, they, they would wake up in the morning, roll themselves a joint while still in bed, light that, and smoke it. And um, they often did damage to themselves, and they didn't get good grades. And, the thing is, if you wake up, if they'd woken up in the morning, picked up a bottle of vodka and started drinking from it, they would have known they had a problem, and everybody would have known they had a problem. But because there are none of these rules around the other drugs, none of these socialized, internalized customs around the other drugs, that's, uh, that's why um, they get out of control. I can sort of imagine a possible world in a few hundred years' time where, you know, uh, somebody would say, well, as it's, as it's Christmas Day, children, I think you can all have 
one toke, one toke on the crack pipe, okay? Now, I'll take it out, it, 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 and it, you know, I, I, I don't know, but it, it, if you had such rules around it, then um, things could often could quite um, well work out properly. Just as an uh, interesting point on this, when gin, um, when, when spirits first came to Britain in about, 1700, the year, about the year 1700, um, it was gin mainly, and it was this new drink, and everyone went, wow, I want to try the new drink. So people in Britain drank beer, they drank pints of beer, and they would drink it all day, you know, breakfast. So they, they would say, give me a pint of gin, and then drink a pint of gin. And they would often just drop down dead. I mean, seriously, thousands of people died like that because they didn't know how to drink gin. That you, you know, gin is something you drink in the evening out of a small glass, and you put some tonic in it probably to dilute it, and all those other rules which we have since developed. But a new drug, a drug which doesn't have its customs and its rules, is a dangerous drug. Excuse me. <coughs> yeah. Do you observe any relationship between violence and alcohol? Because some areas of the world, for example, in Scotland, Glasgow, yes. is there any direct relation between violence and uh, per capita consumption uh, of alcohol? Well, any statistically significant, do you think? Yes, uh, as I was saying at the beginning of the speech, and most of what happens to you when you're drunk is culturally defined. If you come from a culture that tells you that when you drink, you will get violent, then when you drink, you will get violent. And, but if you come from a culture that when, tells you that when you get drink, uh, when you when you drink you will sing and become romantic, then you will sing and become romantic. Uh, alcohol, def I'm sorry, I was about to say alcohol has a problem with Glasgow. Um, Glasgow d does have a problem with alcohol. Yes, you, you can test this quite precisely. It's uh, all about the cultural associations and what you expect to happen. Portugal, for example, has a very non-violent drinking culture. They they like to uh, drink all day, but they, they, they don't get into fights. But oddly enough, if you give a young Portuguese man British beer, he uh, is much more likely to become violent. This has been tested. Um, and that's because he associates the British beer with the kind of British tourists who go to Portugal on holiday, get drunk, and start fights. So it's at that level of um, cultural drive that alcohol will do to you what you think it will do. If you believe it will make you hallucinate, it can make you hallucinate. Yeah, talking about uh, British beer, uh, I have a quick, quick question. What, is there any historical reason why beer is served warm in British pubs? Uh, historically, it's, uh, uh, well, first of all, it's simply that um, we didn't historically have refrigeration at all, so obviously all beer was warm at some point. It's a, I've always thought it's so terrible to think what the world was like before ref uh, refrigeration, before widespread refrigeration, when you just couldn't get a cold beer on a hot day. Um, most countries, obviously, um, uh, well, uh, the whole world acquired fridges, but they also required, uh, acquired air conditioning. In Britain, the cellars are cold enough that we don't really need. Uh, so, uh, British beer isn't served warm, uh, that's a myth. It's served at cellar temperature. The cellars in a, a British building usually stay about uh, maybe eight or nine degrees Celsius all year round. So it's, it's not warm, it's, it's cooler than room temperature. And um, we don't need it that cold. I mean, except on, uh, in the same way that in, in Britain, we don't really have air conditioning. I mean, obviously, uh, here it would be hard to survive without it. In Britain, it's depressingly easy to survive without air conditioning. It's snowing and raining in London even now, and I'm in Kerala. <laughs> God's own country. <laughs> <laughs>